and you, you're going to be famous. Hmm? You're going to be famous. Who knows? You might be. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, tell us some, some stories of, of when you were younger in Roslyn and playing around the mines and your dad going to work in the mines, what it was like growing up in Roslyn. And we what can you tell did. you some good ones there. In the Brookside Bunch. What we were doing in the Brookside Bunch? Yeah. Angels. <laughs> Anything was just slightly legal. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that that doesn't do anything to do with mining. No, but it has about your growing that's, up days. That's right? telling about my father in his underwear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Went down and bought some firecrackers. We, we were we were high school boys then. Went down to South Clare, and that was the only place you could buy them then. <coughs> and when we come home, we got off at Marco's there. Straight up Washington Avenue. That's where we all lived. Up that, and we'd going up that street. And it was about ten o'clock at night. And everything was dark up there because the mines were working the next day. And we were throwing those cherry bombs, by wham, you know, by wham, and firing firecrackers. And and my place was the first one we come to. And I looks over and over there, and I could, I was going to jump. There's a kind of a ditch on there where the for the street to drain on. I was going to jump, jump that ditch, and I looked up there, and then up on the porch, I see this white thing like a ghost, you know? My father in his long underwear. So I turn around, and he says, come on, Joe. <laughs> oh, that boy, I ain't that stupid. <laughs> I started to go the other way, you know? I jumped across the ditch and went back on the street, about that time, zip! flower pot come right past my head. <laughs> that was one of the many nights I spent sleeping in the barn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another, another time a fella brought a gallon of whiskey to my father for a gift. So I, I was going to help my father drink it without his knowledge. And that was on the Saturday. When, when I went downtown that night, I went down early about, well, it wasn't dark yet. And I used to go to Marco's all the time. I just made it to the back end of the company store there by, by Marco's. I looked across the street at Marco's. I could see four or five guys there, but I couldn't make out a one. And, oh, boy, there's no place for me. I walked down along the company store and around over and back up and went home to the back and it was getting dark already then so uh, I, I lay down in the in the garden there something high like that anyway in the morning when I got up I went down down to the kitchen my mother was down there and she was kind of mad I said what's the matter ma oh the neighbor's dogs she says she's got into our garden and the parsley that I planted, she had she had a nice little bunch, you know, not very big, for soup, about that high. He, he knocked all my parsley down. That's what the hell I fell asleep in. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I used to roll around. <laughs> Boy, I never did say a word about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never was with them guys when they do that. Yeah, they, two or three of him and him and, him and Hiken. No, not Philiboites. No. Philiboites was a year or two older. You know, if you weren't the same year, you didn't c go along together. Oh. Who 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 are those young kids around when they were just a year younger than you? You didn't want them around. Heck no. Yeah, they're crazy fools. They try to climb up a tree, you know, not the big one, but uh, them pine trees around here would grow a little six inches or so or, and get up there about 20 feet. And the guys would go climb up to the top practically. And then the one guy would stand at the bottom and chop them down. 
Can you see through that? Can you drag a tree down? Did they, ha did they have fun? <laughs> this, uh, this one kid come home, and, and he said, boy, Ma, he said, I'm sick. He hurt himself you know, with his stomach or something. And he was sick for about a week. And that stopped that old stuff of climbing trees and chopping the guys down with it. <laughs> Oh yeah. Up there, up there behind the old shop, there used to be. Well, that's where the mine water come out. And there was a dam made there. I don't know what was that spade for. Not very big though. The water wasn't deep. Maybe about three feet or so. We used to go swimming in there. In the cold weather. And, there, and this one year, it was, I think, about March. Real nice day in March. We were walking around up there. And the pond was full. Somebody says, boys, why don't we go swimming? It's nice and warm. So we decided to go swimming. And then we'd taken our clothes off. We all had long underwear on because it was cold yet. It was <laughs> and this one kid, he took his long underwear off and he kind of draped him over a bush, nearby a bush there. And pretty soon he's, he looked, he said, oh, he said, look at my underwear, on the one on a the, on the bush. It looked something like a Dalmatian hound over there. The sparks were flying up and falling on the underwear and burning, burning holes, you know. And he was crying, look at my underwear. When my mother sees those, you're going to kill me. <laughs> And he, he was the same one in, uh, in the winter when it got cold and the snow was wet, then it froze and formed a crust on the top, you know. We used to go up in the wood with sleds and stay right up there because you could stay right up on top and you had, to, you had everything to, to, to go to, you know, if, if you, as long as you missed the trees. And there was an old logging road that we used to ride down in a kind of a crooked thing. And this one one kid, he come out there, he had a brand new pair of rubber boots on. Even the powder was still on my these, but powder on the boots in them days. And so we went up there and we come down on our ride and we stand around her talking and this kid says, Oh and he started to cry. I said, What's the matter, Johnny? Look at my boots. The toes were struck stuck in out. He wore him out dragging his feet down there, you know, steering that way with it. <laughs> oh, is my mother going to kill me? And she is just a woman that would kill him, too, I think. <laughs> yeah, boy. Tell the story about the trestles going up towards it, towards number six, number eight, the big trestles. And what you want to say about the kids riding the, the shovels down the trestle on the cable? Well, we used to do that all the yeah, time. Tell us, this is, this is a good one. Tell, us, tell about the trestles and how big they were, and, and so you, uh, the, the people get the idea of. of well, we didn't we didn't go on no high trestles. That just that one behind the rocks up there. We used to go across that one. That's where Bruno he hit a snag in uh, in the cable. The cable had a sticker sticking up, you know. Well, I'll tell you about the the, the mine rails. What the heck were they? They were under three foot in width, you know. And then um, th they had the cable. The, the hoist was way up on top of the ridge up here. And they had double track all the way down to the, where they dumped the coal down here. <coughs> and it was always, one, one trip was down and the cable was out there, you know. So then like on Sundays, if there was nothing for us to do, we'd go out there and find an old shovel at a dump that had been thrown away. And uh, the shovel were made so that, you know how the handle goes down in the, into the metal? It's kind of forked down there. And that thing would fit right over that rope, that cable. Metal cable. And you set that on, on the cable and then set it on, on top of the shovel. You had to put a little sand on top for a kind of an insulator because it got pretty warm sometimes. <laughs> and uh, 
this one time, this one kid, he he was going he was going quite fast, and, and he hit one of those breaks in the, in the cable. It stuck up a little bit. And like I say, we we found the shovels in the in the dump, so they weren't you know any good anymore. Some of them had big cracks or little cracks, whatever the case may be. And evidently, one of those slips come up through that crack, and he caught it. He's a boy, you should have heard him. He sounded like a coyote up in the middle of the <laughs> Yeah, we, we all escorted him down to the doctor's office where the... Legion Hall is now. Yeah, the Legion Hall is there now. It used to be a doctor's office. And, and Dr. Mooney was taking that sliver out. And you boys come here and watch, he says. So we we standing there watching, you know. He said, you see what happens when you do things you're not supposed to? He's giving us a lecture at the same time, you know. <laughs> Finally, he got through, and he said, okay, you boys can go. He said, now, don't go back up there now. He said, it's getting dark anyway. <laughs> yeah, and then a, a tell, Joe, I'll tell a story about when the, when the trains used to come on Washington Avenue, you know, with the boxcars full of grapes, and Bob Ronald was the cop then. Full of boys. Remember when the, the grapes used to come on the railroad tracks when we had the depot down here? The you know, the bread used to come in, yeah. Yeah, the, the yeah and in boxes. The, the boxes were made out of, it looked something like bamboo, you know, big bamboo, it was split open. And they were, they were boxes about that high about that long and about that wide, he used to send bread in them. And grapes. Remember grapes, hauling grapes? Wait a minute now. The grapes is another thing. Yeah. The, these boxes, they'd, they'd send them the bread up to the stores in Roslyn on, on the train, you know. And then uh, every morning, he'd, he'd come up and bring some more, and he'd pick up the empties when they were going back, take them back. And we went by there one night. There were four or five of us from that part of town we call Brookside walking around. And there was quite a few of them boxes out there on the depot the platform. So we started stacking them one on top of the other. We had one stacked up pretty high. And this crazy kid, he went up there and he got up on top. And he sat up there. And he, pretty soon he started, you know, and he was going back and forth, you know. And uh, he said, oh, boy, look at me. You know, you're going back and forth like that. And pretty soon we hear, hey, you kids. We look across the street to the, toward the soda pop place. Here's a night cop. And he, he was deaf on kids, especially if they were doing wrong things. And he had feet, shoes about that long, I guess. <laughs> and that kid, he bailed off those things up there. When he bit, when he hit the ground, his feet was already in, in motion. He was going for the toward Brookside, where there were flat cars over there, lined up in front of where uh, what's his name, the mayor's places over there. Yeah, there used to be double track over there where they put coal cars, the big coal cars from the railroad, so they could fill them down to Temple down below there. And uh, all them guys running by that, and me, I was I was slow. I was a slow runner. And old Bob, he was catching up with me. I could about feel his breath on my neck. And the next thing I thought, I'm going to feel that big shoe. <laughs> so I cut in between the cars, you know, and I ducked underneath the cars and went underneath them full blast. I don't know how I didn't tear my head off or something. And that's, what, that's the only thing to save me, because he wouldn't do it. Because years later we were in a we were in the hospital down at Cleom, Bob and I both in the same room, you know. And, we, and I asked him about different things that happened when he was on the force. And then then he would tell me about different things. I said, "Do you remember that night when you chased the little Brookside kids or off those bread boxes and they got away from you?" Yeah, I remember. He said, "I almost had one too." <laughs> I said, what happened to him? Well, he was smart. He he ducked under the under that damn car. I was afraid to do that. <laughs> do you know who he was, Bob? 
He said, no, I didn't know him. I couldn't see his face. But that was me. <laughs> you? <laughs> but he wouldn't, he wouldn't get mad at me then because he was full of arthritis, you know. And every time he got up out of bed, I had to help him put, put his robe on him. So he, he'd always tell me stories about what happened in Ross. He was a good cop, though. He was really a good cop. Huh? He was a good cop. Yeah. Somebody like Bob Ronald around now. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a good cop. He, he wasn't afraid of nobody. Yeah, he was a good one. That, that one time down there, where the Craven just lived now, I don't know who lived there, but there was, the colored people were there. And this one guy, I don't know what he'd done, but... He ran away, and he ran underneath that house. And the people said, told Cal Bob where, where he was, he said, under that house. Well, I'll go up and get him. He said, you better knock it. He's got a gun. He'll shoot you. Oh, I don't think he'll shoot. So Bob went up there, and he kneeled in front of that hole. He just called that guy by name. He says, come on out. No, I ain't coming out. And anybody tries to come in here, I'll shoot them. Oh, you ain't going to shoot nobody. Come on out. No, I ain't coming out. Okay, I'm coming in then. And he went in and brought him out. <laughs> he just bluffed his way in. <laughs> I said, what would you have done if he'd have shot, you know, shot? He said, well, I don't know. I could, the way I was laying, I couldn't even get, a, get near my gun. <laughs> I wouldn't have shot at him anyway, he said, because I knew the guy. Maybe that's why the guy didn't shoot at him, too. Can I tell the story about the grapes? Oh, grapes. Oh, grapes, that brings back no sore knuckles and stuff. <laughs> they used to get grapes from California in, in, um, in boxcars. Some of them were... Some of them were refrigerated. Well, yeah, they had ice in them. You want to call that refrigerated? But uh, and they put them in the parting up there, where the Marco's place. You know where Marco's place is? There used to there used to be a double track. There was a park cars, railroad cars in there. So they used to, on, on one track, they used to put these cars with grapes on them. Then in the evening, I don't know why they waited till the evening, well, so the people wouldn't see who's getting all the grapes, you know, who ain't and all that. There's a lot of winemakers here. And um, th there were grapes for making wine. And some of them guys would really buy some loads, too, I tell you. And anyway, the kids would be there, you know, and them grapes look good, boy, you know, and They'd be loading the truck, and you'd reach out to get a bunch, you know. By the time you, your hand got on a grape, about the same time, there'd come a, one of those slats they used to, you know, nail down the boxes so they won't tip over when they're running. They're like a, a quarter of an inch thick, maybe about two inches wide. They'd bring one of those down. As long as they brought them down flat ways, it wasn't bad, but when they brought them edgeways, it kind of hurt. <laughs> But there's a lot of that going on as went down there. Gee. Tell us about the, when the book side gang would want to go to the river. You used to tell me you'd, you'd send two guys as decoys to run through Fourth and Fifth Street so so the rest of you guys could get through Fourth and Fifth. Oh yeah. Just tell us about the, the gangs in town. How you had your little gang. Was Brookside couldn't go up Fifth Street. No, we weren't. We weren't mean. We we didn't do nothing bad. They w we'd go swimming over to the river, over the hill past the cemetery. And up there on 5th Street, that's the last street over there, there was two guys lived up there, two, not well, two, two young fellas. They were bigger than us. Boy, they were mean. They would just be, love to beat you up. And every time we'd go up through there, they'd, they'd, they'd be after us. We'd have to run for our lives, you know. So there was one time we had to run our run for our lives going to the river. We went out down there and swam. Then we were coming back, and we said, "Uh oh, them guys will be waiting for us because they know we're over here." I don't know who thought about, but they, they picked out two of the kids. You, you two guys are the fastest runners. 
you take the trail going over by the reservoir. The reservoir is above a little ways. And uh, while they chase you, we'll, we'll go to town down the, down the street. <laughs> <laughs> send, send out decoys. And then guys bid on that after, after that all the time. Always bid on it. You know, I found that story about when that gal, I don't know, was she a colored gal or was it already Woods or who? She was drunk and causing some problem at Marshall's, was it? And the cops came up and was going to take her to jail. She wasn't going to go. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. She, did, she, said, she said, you can't take me to jail. You're too small to carry me. And he was a small guy for a cop. And he told her before, when she was sober, he said, if you, ever, if you get drunk again like you were the last time and you holler around town, I got to take you to jail because people are complaining. No, the people like me, she says. And they did like her, you know, because she was, she was a real booster for the town and for the baseball team and everything. So this one day she was drunk, boy, and she was having a good old time down there and here come a little Johnny the cop come on take you to, to the jail he gets her into the arm they start walking down there talking away and pretty she said ah, I ain't going to jail and she rips that little arm around and Johnny leaves the ground you know, with his feet <laughs> then they talk some more pretty soon they start walking back to where they come from you know he wouldn't go she wouldn't go and he, he he trying all the time. Finally, he says, "Well, he said, what are you going? Do you going to stay here till I come back? Oh yeah, I'll wait for you." She says. So he left. And when he come back, he come back with a wheelbarrow. He said, "Get in." <laughs> he said, "I'm going to take you to jail. Even if, even if it's in the wheelbarrow, I'm going to take you." Yeah. She didn't get very far with that either because she'd, she'd get on one side of the wheelbarrow, you know, and then he'd kind of, you know, <laughs> throw him off balance. Boy, the people were having a grand day that day. Well, there used to be a lot, a lot of good times around town. Hmm. So tell us about when you worked downtown at the barber shop. What, Rob, what was going on in Roslyn then and what stories they had and stuff like that. Well, about Kelly Ramsey's wife. No, I, w I won't. I don't want to talk about people that well, others know. You know. <laughs> yeah, she married your kid. <laughs> she was. She was. She was. She was mean. I was. I was a shoe shine boy then. That's when I. I was going to high school then. I first started in another barber shop, where the. What's the name of that cafe? That railroad outfit. Huh? What, about what year did you work in the barber shop there? What, you worked what? for Harper's. Uh, oh, about 30, 1930. That was Harper's Harper's barber shop then, the old man Harper. I think it was three or four chairs in there. Mm -hmm. And he took a liking to me. And he said, uh, Joe, he says, I'm going to make a barber out of you. I said, I don't want to be a barber. Oh, yeah, it's good, good living. He said, I'll make a barber out of you. <coughs> so the first thing they had to learn how to do was when the, the customers got out of the chairs, you know, to walk over with a brush, start brushing them, you know. I said, I can't do that. Yes, you can. I said, no, I'm too bashful. I'll help you, he says. I wonder what the hell he's gonna do now. So when he got through cutting the guy's hair, he's hard brush, you know. That meant for me to come over there and brush. So I'd brush him off. Some guys say thanks, some guys give you a nickel or a dime, whatever it might be, you know. And there was one guy in Rosin, old old Potts Pasquin. He was one of those guys that <laughs> you never knew what the hell he was saying anyway. And uh, he got up out of the chair, and the uh, old man Harper hollered, brush, you know. I went over there and, hey, 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 get away from me. <laughs> hollered at me to beat hell. You know, geez. So I had felt about that goddamn big. Kind of felt like I wanted to turn around and walk out of the joint. 
Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't learn to be a barber there because it wasn't long after that the barber shop caught a fire it was during the night and it, it all burned down. All my shoe shining and stuff, my chair and everything burned up. Then I was out of a job again. And Kelly Ramsey had a barber shop across the street. Little, uh, what's his name? His brother's fooling around with old. With, huh? <laughs> well, anyway. Yeah, you can leave that part out. <laughs> well, anyway, this boy, this other boy, he. He, d he didn't want to be a shoe uh, shiner. I don't know why. He had, a, he had a good spot over there. Most of the young fellows went, you know, before on Saturday nights they come get shoe shines. And uh, anyway, he quit. So find that a guy that owned a barbershop, he come to me one day and he asked me, he said, would I care to go to work for him, you know? So I said, sure, I'll go. Cause and so uh, I'd go down after school in the evening, you know, and see if there's anything to be done. And then with those days, they used coal, coal to heat the place up with. In fact, it, Kelly even he heated coal to, to heat the water. It had a little stove about that high with a water tank built right on top to heat the water real quick. And so, what was I going to tell about that anyway? You had to keep the coal bucket full. You had to keep the fire going. Yeah, and and then, uh, boy, when his wife would come down on Saturday nights to pick him up, and, she was mean. and uh, the guys that were sitting in there after closing time, you know, well, I gotta go. I gotta go. They <laughs> clear out, you know, <laughs> leave me and Kelly by ourselves practically. Joe, uh, yeah, come on, I need a shine. And don't get that damn polish on my socks either. She used to scare the hell out of me the way she'd holler, you know. But she was good hearted, Hick. I wasn't afraid of that woman. When I worked for Eliza, the woman, she'd come in the store, and she kind of had me buffaloed. And I told Eliza, I'm afraid of that woman. So Eliza says, when she comes in, you just let me wait on her. He looked, he even, he even acted like a bulldog, and she even looked like a bulldog. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Tell about the, uh, the story when you and Jeannie were um, butchering turkeys in the meat market, and that, that one of them plucked and wasn't dead. Oh, the butcher shop used to get the turkeys live. That was when? About 1930, 31? And there's the four of us, well, the, the butcher's son, he, we run around with him. And there's three others uh, of us. Were, we were we our little gang, you know. We were always together. And so he says to us one day, one night, he says, tomorrow night you guys come down to the butcher shop. I'll be down there, huh? Yeah, we'll, we'll come down. He didn't say why or anything, you know. So the next night we went down there, and he says, I got 26 turkeys to kill and, and pull the feathers on. And there's one guy said, oh, what the hell? That's a 10-minute job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see how they done that? I don't know how to do it now, but them old days, it was kind of a cruel thing, I thought. Just bring your neck. Well, you take a long pointed knife, just about, it's almost pointed, and you tie the turkeys two feet together, then you hang him on a, on a hook, about the proper height to pull him, you know. And you take that knife, I didn't do it, the, the, the butcher's son, he did all of that. Put that mutt up, up, to, up at the base of their, their tongue, you know, up in, not tongue, but their mouth, make a couple strikes across that. I guess it goes right into the brain up there somewhere. Then you, then they, 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 they hang there, and you start pulling feathers. And as you're pulling, you can just see those feathers going like that. 
you know, just like a like the like a turkey's relaxing or something. Well, yeah. <laughs> we're wading around the feathers just about up to our knees sometime. And then one kid says, "Hey, look at my turkey." All he had was a couple of feathers on each end of each wing, you know, and his head was up. He said, "Gobble, gobble, gobble." Oh. He was naked. That's what they say. Naked as a jaybird. <laughs> Oh, we was crazy guy. We about the time we was, about that time we were starting to smoke. We even tried smoking sawdust. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that would give you a heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> then out in the woods, we used to smoke pine needles, them long pine needles. There was a stem that grew. When it when it died, it was it was hollow about big as your finger, and you're taking stuff, pine needles in the stem, and then light her up. Yeah. As long as you didn't, as long as you didn't puff too fast, you puff real fast.